Good evening. I am Patrick Cassidy. I'm the artistic director for Studio 10 and welcome to Studio 10 Talks. It is so great to be here. Uh, without further ado, I'm just going to bring on our producer because she's so lovely. Say hello to Julie Garnier. Hi. Hey, Julie. Was that fast enough for you? Oh, my gosh. I was not expecting that. <laughs> so now sing, Julie. Sing on cue. <laughs> How's your week been? It's been great. It's yeah. been really, really good. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun uh, prepping this show. It's been a blast. So it, I'm excited. It, it's going to be a fun one. Mine too has been great. I started casting for our first show of It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play. My, That's first, really my first casting session in two years. <laughs> of course, of years, course it is. Two years of living in, in Tennessee to actually cast and see some un incredible talent here in Tennessee. We put a great cast together. We start rehearsals on November 22nd. We'll talk more about that in the show. But yeah, it was it was wonderful and um, and excited about about this week. Um, you know, my mother is finally coming to Tennessee to see my home. I can't believe it. Yeah, it's going to be great. Oh, that's going to be wonderful. So we'll talk about that and and remember uh, just out, out there for everybody. So we survive on donations and. Uh, producing live theater. And finally, we're gonna be producing some live theater. So please give donations uh, to studio10.com. And, uh, and there is a debate, you can, uh, the Studio 10 by clicking the donate button above or by messaging STT to 202-858-1233. Please support Studio 10. You are the reason that we are still here. This show and you guys and your incredible generosity and contributions. Jules, I'll see you in a little while. Sounds good, have a great time. Thanks so much. Um, tonight's show is is a very special show uh, for me um, for a, many reasons. I, I, in many ways, I'm, I think, more nervous about tonight and more excited about tonight than I was Patti LaPone or Nathan Lane or Audra McDonald or Stephen Sondheim or any of them. Very, very great that we had them. But um, tonight, our guest is a, an American writer, producer, actor, and singer. After making his name as a performer, he went on to create and write and or produce a number of critically acclaimed television series, including American Gothic, produced with Sam Raimi, Roar, starring a then unknown Heath Ledger, Cold Case, Cover Me, The Agency, Blue Bloods, Invasion, and Emerald City. He currently serves as an executive producer and writer for the hit NBC series New Amsterdam. He signed a contract with Warner Brothers Records and it led to three multi-platinum album, albums and numerous top 10 hits, including Do Do Run Run, That's Rock and Roll, Hey Dini, and Do You Believe in Magic. He received a Grammy nomination for his efforts and on television, he starred in the ABC's television series, The Hardy Boys Mysteries. He has appeared on Broadway in the hit musical Blood Brothers with our half brother. And in 2019, he took his self-penned music and storytelling show, The Magic of a Midnight Sky to the Stage. And he has successfully introduced a collection of fine wines entitled My First Crush, which he donates $2 per bottle to feed hungry children nationwide. He makes his home in the wine country of Santa Barbara with his wife, Tracy, and their four children, and more animals than you can believe. I've seen them all. Please welcome my brother, Mr. Sean Cassidy. That was the longest bio I've ever heard. <laughs> and I and I trimmed it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good God. <laughs> well, How are you, are, Larry? It's good to see you. Oh, I wish I had my bow tie on. How uh, long have, uh, how long have uh, you owned John Lennon's glasses? Uh, yeah, I know. I know. They they pick up the light too. It's because I can't see, and these are <laughs> and these I think are the most stylish. Uh, how well, are you? Are you in Santa Barbara right now, right? Uh, I really can't disclose my location. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a fun hour. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, how are you? I'm fine. I'm a, a little overworked. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I uh, am working on that television show, New Amsterdam, you mentioned, and I am currently writing a couple of pilots, and I'm preparing to uh, come to... Uh, Franklin, Tennessee, to, to do a benefit uh, for your theater, which I'm really looking forward to this weekend, and um, going out on the road in uh, September. And uh, got and these we'll, these children, these children, these children. And all, and all the you have you have one child who has 
I could be, I'm sure, uh, going to go to a top college and play uh, uh, baseball, your, your oldest, there. And then you have one who I believe is going to sell real estate, or at least that's what he told me when I was there, your son, yeah. Rowan. You may end up working on a shrimp boat. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what uh, any of them are going to do. They'll all be fine. They're all great. They're uh, it's an amazing thing about kids, and I know you have them, but I have uh, seven of them. Uh, eight, uh, including a stepdaughter, and uh, I've, I've basically been having kids since I got my driver's license. So I've seen this uh, this dynamic for a number of years, and what I'm absolutely convinced of is that we have so little to do with who they are. They just come in the way they are, and it's our job to decide how to help them specifically as opposed to coming up with this mandate about how to parent, you really need to tailor it to the person because they're just all different and they might as well be from anybody else. Uh, and they're all different from each other. And yet I'm more excited about spending time with them and watching what they do with the, their lives than I am about anything else, I think. Do you find, when I look at both Cole and Jack, I think of, I look at them and I say, oh, that so reminds me of me, or that so reminds me of Melissa. Yeah, those characteristics in both of them. And then there are characteristics about them that are so individually them. And you have seven children. Do you look at them and go, oh, that's me. That's Tracy. That No, not at all. I, no. I, see, I see personality traits, certainly. But doing the math on who they are and how they you know, ended up that way is, is actually interesting. Because I, I can pull things that I see from our dad or mom or you or... People I don't know. I, I mean, they're a, a you know a DNA salad from many, many, many people, mm -hmm. uh, and um, their experience certainly informs them. But there's a great expression: nobody grows up in the same house. Mm -hmm. You and I certainly didn't. I mean, you and I grew up in the same physical house with the same parents, but our experiences uh, and how we um, process those experiences, I think, are night and day. Right. Yeah. I told I, I couldn't agree more. So, by the yeah, way, Ryan will be the same. By the way, did I ever tell you that you were an incredibly attractive child? Okay. Well, <laughs> look. Oh no. Yep. Look at that kid. I mean, do we have another one, Julie? I think we do. That act, that actually is my uh, that's oh. my. Uh, oh. Show that again, Julie. Show that again. That's the the stunt baby they brought in. Um, yeah. Why does that kid look so miserable, Sean? <laughs> uh, because he's posing for a uh, a not natural picture at all. <laughs> yeah, which Life magazine is there with lights in his face. We were put through so many. <laughs> you were pretending to look like a normal family. Uh, so let's let's talk about that for one a minute because I think that's interesting. Does anyone know we're related, by the way? I'm sorry. Does anyone know we're related, by the way? You mean tonight? I'm sure yeah. that. Oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's talk about though, because you and I have talked about it amongst ourselves about what it was like from your, from your, from where you stood growing up in our house versus me. Um. Well, well, yeah, I'm uh, I'm the oldest. For those um, who, who don't <laughs> who don't follow our whatever, uh, I am the oldest uh, in our house. Uh, Patrick is next in line. Ryan is our, the third youngest, uh, and David, our half brother, would be a uh, guest star occasionally. He would come in and uh, and visit us, but it was mostly uh, ninety percent of the time was Patrick, Ryan, and myself, and. You know, the oldest tend to sort of fall into uh, traditional roles and the middle, these are all generalizations, of course, but the middle tend to rebel and the youngest just trying to get out of the way to stay alive, uh, all generalizations, but it, it kind of applies to us. Uh, I was a very, very, very old kid. Um, and I think that I was uh, trying to... Uh, manage and balance what I perceive to be a lot of uncertainty in our house because mm -hmm. parents, you know, uh, not there a lot of the time because of jobs and left alone a lot. And, you know, who's in charge here? Well, if I don't step up, who will? So I felt I had to. And, uh, you know, I felt like I parented you for better or for worse as much as your actual parents. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I've had to work really hard not to do that with a lot of other people in my life because that was my experience growing up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, did you find that you spent, because as you were saying that, I was thinking about, did you find that you spent a lot of time though at other people's homes? I did too. I mean, I, I was at, you know, my, my friend's homes every weekend uh, staying over simply because, you know, mom and dad weren't there. They were working all the time. Yeah, mom and dad were not there a lot. Um, and I can't think of any friends I had whose parents were. I, I felt like we grew up like peanuts kids. There were no adults around. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, my, my second home was Rosemary Clooney's house. Miguel Ferrer was a very good friend. Uh, his All of her kids were good friends. And um, the, Rosemary tended to take in a lot of kids. So that would be like a halfway house for a lot of kids. And the kids that I knew almost all of them weren't parented. Uh, uh, some of them were destructively uh, non-parented. Mm -hmm. I don't think we were, but I certainly know a lot of people that were. And and uh, consequently, all of the people at Rosemary's were kind of parenting each other. And miraculously, just about everyone that lived there part-time not only survived, but thrived. I, I know many, many people from that house who went on to become wildly successful in a wide variety of different endeavors. And I think it's because we had each other's backs. We really looked out for each other and we still do. Yeah. And from, again, from where I saw, sat, it was, you guys were all incredibly smart. And, yeah. and uh, I was the sort of the younger brother uh, at, at the time. And, uh, but got to, I learned to play poker with you guys <laughs> as a kid. And my money was taken a lot before I learned how to really play. Um, it was, uh, it, it was, it was great. It was great. Uh, so tell me, I, I want to ask you about being a dad because you were a dad in your twenties. You were a dad in your thirties. You were a dad in your forties and a dad in your fifties too. Yeah. You became a dad in your fifties. You became a new dad. Yeah. 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 Which, 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 which decade has been harder? Which decade has been easier? 20s. 20s. Was hard. Much 20s harder. was the hardest decade for me in every way. And yet it, I think I probably had the most growth in my 20s because I had had, um, you know, sort of a big explosive uh, opening of a career at 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. And by the time I was 21, I got married and all I wanted to do was escape and hide out. And I did for 10 years, basically, I stayed home. Uh, but having kids kind of gave me an excuse to be home and and focus on them, even though I didn't know what I was doing. I tried, you know, tried my best. And I, you know, I would stay home and read every book in the world because I didn't go to college. But I and I felt self-conscious about it in my early 20s because so many of my friends went to a lot of really good schools. And I'm thinking, well, I better try and catch up or, you know, I'm going to be the the slow one when they come back. And as it turns out, very few of them were reading all the books I was reading when they came back. They were at keggers and football games. And I'd, you know, I'd read Moby Dick twice. So, uh, uh, and I was with my kids. And being a really young father uh, has a great upside in that my eldest son, Jake, is 35 and he's a man and I can hang out with him. And you know, our father died when I was 18, so I never had the relationship of being an adult with an adult uh, father. Mm -hmm. and I have it with Jake, and, and it's great. And on the flip side, our youngest, Marin, is 10. And I don't have grandchildren. I could, I suppose, but I, I don't. None of my older kids had had kids yet. But um, I love the experience of being with Marin and Lila, who's 12, and Rowan, who's 14, and Caleb, who's 16 because I actually have something to teach them now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't have when I was 22. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but the twenties were my hardest because I was just trying to figure it out. I didn't know what I was going to do for a living. I didn't know uh, how I was going to live, where I was going to live, really what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I, my, you know, it's funny talking to you because you know all of this, I think. Um, well, some of it, not not everything. It's, I'm I'm as fascinated as anybody watching. Trust um, me. Well, it's like writing scenes for characters that are both in the same profession. You can't write a scene with two heart surgeons 
talking about, gee, how do you do this? Because they both know. Mm -hmm. um, so you always need the person carrying the dumb stick in the scene is going, well, you, how do you do that with the heart? Um, <laughs> um, but uh, having had this crazy success at such a young age uh, afforded me time to stay home and try and figure out really what I wanted to do. And I very quickly realized I didn't want to be a performer. I didn't like the life uh, being in the public eye uh, gave me. I didn't like being chased by photographers. And, you know, I, I locked myself in my house for 10 years. I did the whole thing that everyone that has the experience I had uh, did. But uh, the, the fortunate thing is I recovered from it, which a lot of them don't. Uh, and the way I think I recovered from it was by literally letting it all go, just saying I'm done. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm, I talk about this in my show. I, I, ironically, I'm doing a show now, but it took me 40 years to uh, decide I wanted to go out on the stage and, and perform or talk or do anything again. Uh, and I love it now, but I love it because I've lived this whole other life uh, that's been really fulfilling as a writer. And I decided I wanted to be a writer really young, like on the Hardy Boys when I was acting because I loved this life that writers had. They could go home and make stuff up. And they were, you know, I'd been a magician as a kid. So it was like magic to me. It's like they make stuff up out of the air. And then you show up and 300 people have a job because they had this idea. It's like it just felt like mystical to me. And I wanted to be able to do that. And I didn't know if I could, but I read and I read and I wrote and I wrote and I broke down movies. I watched them and I'd look at the structure and I'd like write it down. And when I was like 29, I sold my first script to uh, a, a guy at Universal who had been like the, the baby, you guys want some coffee guy on the set who was now like the vice president in charge of whatever. <laughs> and, and he gave me a shot. And I, I'm grateful to him and like grateful to a lot of people to this day that let me in that door because there was nothing on my resume other than having been an actor and been around some scripts that said I could do that. But I found out I could, and uh, I've had a career, a really extraordinary, extraordinarily fortunate career of, you know, 30 plus years writing and producing television shows. But I'm saying all this because it's, it's sort of a, a metaphor for everything in life. The key to, getting what you want is letting go of what you've had. Mm -hmm. Don't try to hang on to it. Just let mm -hmm. it go. It ha it's, it's over. It's yesterday. It's gone. Yeah. It's gone. You told so, me, you, t you told me, you told me that a lot when I was making the transition too, and it was hard and I made it a lot l later in life. Because we're insecure. We, and, and that's, you know, Hey, I've been on Broadway. Uh, you know, I, I, I got all these accolades for being the pirates of Penzance at 18 or whatever your thing. And I played Madison square garden. I've had gold mm -hmm. records. So I, I have to do that again or I'm not successful. When in fact, if you try and do that again, hey, even if you achieve that, it's just again. It's like, the, what is the greatest thing I could do? Have another number one record? Well, that's nice. And certainly many people have had zillions of them and get a great deal of fulfillment uh, by trying to top themselves or even replicate their own success. All I wanted to do was new stuff. Yeah. Like I was thrilled I did that. I was thrilled I had that experience. And next, now I want to do something else. Now I want to do something else. So the full circle of it all is a few years ago, I started writing and I started writing like, you know, a memoir. People said, you should write your book, write your book. And as I started writing these things and I, and I realized I don't want to write a book for people to read. I wanted to go out and talk to people mm -hmm. and tell them my story because I think it's a universal story. Yeah, I don't that, have anything you think about my experience, except that it was more, uh, you know, public. But your your show uh, that you that you that you penned and you storytelling show with music is a, the magic of a midnight sky. Well, how did you come up with that title? It's in it's in Haydini, right? It's a lyric in Haydini. Yeah, Eric Carmen wrote a great song called Haydini. Eric Carmen also wrote That's Rock and Roll, which was my mm -hmm. second hit record. And when the song was like in the top five, he called me and said, do you like that song? I, I got another one you might like. And he sent me this demo of Hey Dini. And afterwards I said, is this about Dini, Natalie Wood's character in Splendor in the Grass? Because Dini's a unique name. And mm -hmm. he said, yeah, I saw it at the drive-in and fell in love with her. Wow. Magic of the Midnight Sky. He had a crush on Natalie Wood from that movie and he wrote that song. And 
you know, I knew Natalie uh, because our my stepdaughter and her daughter Natasha were friends, and mm -hmm. so it it um it spoke to me. It's just a great pop song, and the magic of a midnight sky um, ties into my history as a magician. It ties into the uh, feeling, the very emotional feeling, um, that I feel like uh, the audience and I share in these shows. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the unique experience. Uh, the, and the weirdness of my particular resume is that I had this massive connection with this generation of kids at a certain time in their life. And they were young, young, you know, eight to 15. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like 18 to 21, which seems like a huge divide then, but not at all now. And, and then I didn't see anybody for 40 years. You know? <laughs> and, and then I, Honestly, what happened, true story, because you know me, Patrick, this is the first interview. This is the first uh, like on camera interview I've done since Oprah. I know. In 2011. You, you, I don't you, do it. I, just, I, I feel incre incredibly privileged. <laughs> so, but and I didn't want to do the Oprah interview. I hadn't done one in 15 years before that. But Oprah called. It was her last season. And. Tracy, my wife, found out she was going to say, you're going to do Oprah because I'm going with you and I want to meet Oprah. <laughs> OK. And I'm at Disney then and I'm working on a show and I'm like, what am I going to yeah, I'm going to go there, you know, put on a satin jacket and pretend to be a pop star, you know. And I talked to a couple friends of mine uh, who are clearly wiser than myself. And they said, you don't have to do that. They've lived a life, too. Mm -hmm. You know, y you can just go out and tell them who you are now and you'll have a connection with them or you won't. And next, you know. OK, so that was sort of freeing. And and then they called and said, would you sing something? And I'm like, oh, boy, all right. I don't have a band now. I'll sit at the piano and just doodle, you know, a little medley together, which I did anyway. But I went on Oprah and I walked out onto the stage and there is this house full of mostly women some men but mostly women in their mid or, you know 40s and i've told this story before um and i get emotional when i tell it it's crazy but i saw all of the childhood in these adult in adults eyes i saw this look in their eyes that i'd seen at madison square garden in 1979. Yeah. It like it didn't go away and it was very touching it still is and it, and i'm not cynical about that experience because i felt protective of that audience mm. even then and maybe it's because i had young kids or because i had a stepdaughter um i just you know and i was an old very uh, around the world 18 year old i was an old i was an adult basically yep. Yep. um by a lot uh, but i felt like I had a responsibility to kind of live up to their idea of who I was, which wasn't who I was, but it was a presentational, you know, version of who I was. And I saw that again, you know, when I'm, you know, 50 years old and, and I realized that is something that doesn't go away. That is a, uh, it's like Santa Claus. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, and I know what it is because my first crush, she lives there, always lives there. And, and, and I thought that's not something to be um, dismissed or marginalized because pop stars by the name, I mean, pop, it's, it's, it's fluffy, mm -hmm. but the connection is real and it's profound and it doesn't go away. And if you can connect with the people you shared that with once again and meet them on a different plane a different, a, sh a different plane of shared experience. They've had a life. I've had a life. They've loved people. They've lost people. They've gotten married. They've gotten divorced. They've had children. People have lived and died. And there's a lot more miles on the odometer, but there is a timelessness to that connection. Well, it's I profound. And, and I experience it every night in the show and it's amazing. And I'm so grateful that they're there. And I'm so grateful that I'm here. Yeah, and, and I was so grateful when I first saw your show, I saw it up where, where you live. It was one of the first performances you gave of it. And I realized at that moment that I had the same experience from my point of view, having been your younger brother, growing up in the house, listening to you in the den, write those songs. It had such, it, so much of your show and what you went through, you know, as you said, with those fans, 
I had a, a, a an experience too. Being your being your brother and how you know and you became that and then of, of course seeing you at Madison Square Garden or seeing you at the Greek Theater or, or any of those things. I mean, learning my first you know three or four chords on the piano, uh, all of it. So listening to you and watching you tell it, and then of course when you came here to Nashville at the City Winery and you did it just with you uh, and the piano and the guitar, it's overwhelmingly emotional for me and. And I've and I've talked to Ryan about it too. He says the same thing. It's uh, because it's not just your life; it's our life, just like it's the, your fans' life. You know, and it's uh, your life, and it's mom and it's dad, and and it's all of us. That's the thing. It's and again, everything I talk about in the show has nothing to do with uh, pop star success. It has to do with uh, uh, life. And, mm -hmm. and, a, and a universal experience that just happens to have been broadcast uh, in well, a big way because of media. But you know, well, you 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 you're bringing it to the Franklin Theater on November thirteenth, this Saturday night. It's sold out in twelve hours. We can't thank you enough at Studio Ten, Sean, for doing it for us. It's a it's, it's amazing. It's going to be so much fun. I want to talk for a second about and Julie. I want you to bring on. I want to talk about brothers. Our father grew up with brothers. You and I grew up with brothers. Uh, Julie, you have some of those those photographs of us. Look at that. So that's the four of us, Sean. I think it's the only one of the four of us when we're little. And I'm I'm on the left. You're in the middle there in the chair. David's holding Ryan, and Ryan's the baby. What else do you have, Julie? Do you have another? That's from the Sally Jesse Raphael show with mom that was i think maybe the first time all of us were actually on television together i could not have been more miserable that day <laughs> yeah. uh, and why and why, and why was that because ingles guilted me into doing that show oh <laughs> and i was happy to be there with you guys and mom but i thought the interview was horrible and yeah. uh, i really you know you know me well then, then show this one. I think you'll be happy, right? Show the next one, Julie. That was from Ruby and the Rockets. Yeah. And I and for me, Sean. I mean, I, you know, that for me was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. As not just just an actor, I I used to kiss stage twelve every time I went in on that sound stage because obviously David and I were acting opposite each other. Ryan was working as a set decorator on the show. You were the executive producer writer with I know. Your good friend Marsh McCall, and then Mom came on and did an episode. And what yeah. fun! My kids, you know, it's funny. Jack just did this last night. My kids had the same experience with that show as I had growing up with the Partridge Family, and maybe you did too. Which was that they they watched it like as kids, and they go back and they run. Uh, uh, you know, episodes and they, and they say, you know, you guys, dad, you're so funny in this scene. And uncle David was, Oh my God. Was, so, so they were really affected by it in the same way for me, I think watching the Partridge family, if I see an episode now, it still makes me get uh, choked up. Well, I'm glad because I had a, a long conversation with a, a guy who runs a very big film company this morning. I never met him. And we actually did. He said we hadn't met like 30 years ago or something, but it's a big deal. And I I said, yeah, and he's been involved with a lot of success and Academy Awards and all kinds of stuff. And I said, what, you know, excites you these days about projects? And he said, the people. And I said, oh, buddy, you're talking my language because there is nothing, nothing I will do now work-wise. Uh, I don't care if it's the greatest novel in the world that's being adapted into the greatest whatever with the most brilliant director and cat. If I don't love the company of the people I'm with, um, I won't do it because it's all experiential for me now. It has to improve my life experience. I don't care if it's the most successful, biggest money maker in the world or a flat out failure. If my life experience is improved, if the people I'm in a room with while I'm working are worth not being in a room with my wife and my children, then the experience is valuable. And then mm -hmm. I'll do that. And Ruby and the Rockets was from the get go was a labor of love. It was only the only first of all, I'd never done a comedy, half hour comedy. I was an hour drama guy. I wanted to work with you and David 
And I, I, I viewed there being no downside. If the show was a great hit, maybe that would be good. Maybe it wouldn't be good. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, if the show didn't succeed, uh, that would only be bad if the experience was bad and the experience was fantastic. And so it is one of my favorite memories. Um, and I got to work not only with you and David, but Marsh McCall, who was a dear, dear friend, uh, who we sadly lost far too young. Um, Marsh was a brilliant writer and a, an amazing man. He'd, he'd been the head writer on Conan and taught me a lot about uh, comedy. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Did, uh, what was it like with working with, with David? You know, was it, it was interesting, you know, in fact, we actually, let's do, let's do this, Julie. You and I have worked together many times, you know, and David and I had worked together many times. And of course, you and David did did Blood Brothers on Broadway together. But there was mm -hmm. only one moment, one moment in, in the public where the three of us worked together. Show this, Julie, just for a minute. One time, only one time, all three of us did <laughs> work together. I, 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 <laughs> it, um, was, it was what amazing. What was I thinking with that collar? <laughs> I looked like the flying nun. Well, it was what you alluded to in the beginning, that, or what you alluded to in your script that we, we, we've been talking about, about how I had convinced you and David to do that benefit. And by I don't, I still to this day know how, why, how you said yes. And, you know, bless Kay Cole, the choreographer who went up to your office, I guess at Universal and taught you the steps and David got, learned his and we went out there and did it. I'm so glad I did that because it was so much fun, but I'm sure I said no eight times uh, before I said yes. Mm -hmm. I said no to David eight times when he kept saying, come do Blood Brothers, come do Blood Brothers. I had this um, completely wrong notion that having transitioned from a performer, from an actor and a singer to a writer and producer, that I couldn't uh, mix the two, that somehow my credibility in the new area would be compromised if I was seen singing and dancing somewhere. Um, so I just said no all the time. Mm -hmm. Now I just say yes. It's not only is it easier, it actually is more fun. And now I don't care. Wow. <laughs> I just like, uh, I, and, you know, I've, again, I've, I've had the career I've had and I've been really blessed to have it and it's been amazing and it's still amazing. And I don't think I can do anything performer wise that will hurt it in any way, except be over booked, which I am right now. I've, I've just taken on too much. The downside of saying yes all the time is that, you know, dates show up where you have 28 things to do on the same day and you're mm -hmm. like, oh. Who but, had Who had the most influence in your life and why? Um, dad, probably in, ter in terms of being just this huge, powerful, influential figure at a very young and impressionable age. There he is. Um, but not for any of the reasons that a father might imprint uh, a son. Uh, I don't mean it's all negative. Dad certainly had a lot of negative stuff. I mean, a lot of, uh, mental and emotional issues that, uh, were not helped by alcohol and other things. Uh, but he, uh, his love of writers, mm -hmm. his 
talent uh, and appreciation of talent. He just had an eye for extraordinarily talented and, and his wit and, and his humor, yeah. uh, which could slay anyone anytime, which we all, you know, got a taste of, I think. Mm -hmm. um, his aesthetic and his, he didn't practice what he preached, but he taught us taught me and I'm sure you too how important family was he kept he kept talking about it mom's an only child as she will remind you often but dad comes from a family of three brothers uh, two brothers and sister uh, and and uh, he was the baby and and though he wasn't close with his family all he did was talk about how important the family was and we got to know his family and his family were and are beautiful uh, people from the East Coast, uh, Irish Catholic, salt of the earth, long line of railroad engineers. Um, you know, and dad went off and sort of practiced. Went, went, went to Hollywood. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> invented this persona that has nothing to do with where he came from, which as a lot of artists do. Um, but as a sort of a, an artistic figure as someone who aspired to a, a life that I am grateful to have that he didn't have. Mm -hmm. I live on a farm, he, he, you know, since I was a little boy, all he talked about, I want to live on a farm. Well, I want to live on a farm. Right. Pennsylvania, we're going to have a farm. He's like, I can't imagine dad living on a farm in any universe. He would have been miserable on a farm, but somewhere in, it went into me that a farm life is a good life. Mm -hmm. And I live on a farm. It's a little farm. It's not, you know, a fancy farm, but, uh, I have a really good life. I have a good marriage. He didn't have that either. He, mm -hmm. you know, I have good relationships with my children. He was, you know, lucky to spend time with any of us because it right. wasn't a priority for him. Well, that's the interesting thing that I always say is that, you know, with with him in terms of, I think he, you're right. I think he loved family, and I think I mean we had the biggest Christmases in the world, and he loved all of that. And but, I love the idea of it. I don't think he knew how to participate in it. He, 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 he again, he, he was presentational. He loved the, the picture of having his kids around. But once the photographer was gone, I don't think he knew what to do with us. Right. Yeah, and, and you could have a relationship with dad if you played on his terms. You know, dad's mm -hmm. idea of a fun weekend was let's go get a suit made. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, or go, or no, he did take us deep sea fishing because I remember going to the Santa Monica Pier. Yeah. And if God forbid you caught the fish and he didn't, that was a bad Oh, I, I made the mistake of catching the 12 pound halibut and they took my pole. Yeah. Uh, did, well, then, <laughs> since mom yeah. is, is watching us, here we are. Since uh, mom is watching us tonight, what do you have to say to mom? Thank you, mom. Thank you. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, look, mom was away a lot too, but I never, never did not feel loved by mom. Mm -hmm. Never did I not feel at least there was some, even though she enabled a lot of crazy with dad and Marty for sure, um, or stood by and watched it happen. I also felt that she was there for us uh, when the chips were down. Absolutely. I always felt loved by her and I feel it every day. Still, and I'm I, getting, I, I I'm couldn't done, agree done. more. She was the, the yeah. sort of sounding the block, the found for at least for me. I felt she like also uh, again not in a deliberate teaching, but by an example, taught me a lot about how to navigate this business because she, blessed with extraordinary singing voice, beautiful woman, great actor, won an Academy Award, but wasn't driven by the need to have that success. Right. None, she has the, the least show busy person in show business I think I've ever met. And I've met a lot of people in show business now. Uh, and so I, I think I got that from her because I just don't have any of that either. I just don't, I like the work. I like to sing, I like to write. I, I kind of like to perform again now. Um, I love the connection with the audience. And I love the connection with the audience off stage. And I, you know, I remember being a little kid with mom, you know, she'd be on the road somewhere in an elevator and someone would recognize her and she'd just be so gracious and yeah. friendly and easy. And it's like, oh, that's how you treat people. 
What's your question for everybody, as it turns out? What's your favorite? What's your favorite movie of Mom's? Music Man. Ah, nice choice. Mine as well. <laughs> well, McGaffrey's amazing, um, mm -hmm. but The Music Man is like a perfect musical to me. It's a it's a perfect film, and the musical is perfect. Mm -hmm. Score Carousel is my favorite. I think yep. my favorite score of all. Oklahoma is pretty amazing too. I watched it the other night. Gordon McRae, and it, I mean, I I didn't get that movie as much when I was little because there isn't a lot of plot, but it's just so uh, glorious looking and sounding, and and uh, that's a pretty amazing trifecta of movies. Oh. Carousel and the Music Man, you know, yeah. Let's talk about for a second uh, New Amsterdam. Great, what, what a great show! There it is, uh, amazing show and big big hit, big hit for you and. Uh, What's it like? What's the writer's room like? What's that experience? How you break stories and, and how much you guys collaborate and who comes up with this and how does that work? It, it's my favorite working experience as a writer I've ever had. I have to give David Schulner and Peter Horton uh, all of the credit for having me because I didn't create this show and most of almost every show I've been involved with and I've, I've created. Uh, David and I had uh, run a show together called Emerald City and were office mates at Universal. And he sold this pilot, uh, New Amsterdam. And the studio and David uh, asked if I'd be interested in being a consultant on it, which is basically you're sort of helping out while you're writing your own pilots. And I did that uh, for the first year, frankly, somewhat apprehensively, because I'd never worked on a medical show. And my shows tend to be a little more fantastical mm -hmm. um but david and peter um hired such a remarkable group of people not just the writers but the writers in particular and they're the ones i spend the majority of my time with um that i was just so enthused about working on the show and um doing whatever i could you know um to make it better um that it I, I just, I can't, I can't uh, overstate how amazing it's been. And when pandemic happened, I mean, we're a show based on Bellevue Hospital, which is the largest public hospital in the country, one of the oldest, maybe the oldest, and it's in New York. And New York, when COVID hit, was the epicenter of this pandemic. Yeah. And everybody we were talking to at Bellevue, our advisors and our, our, our nurses and, and people that were guesting on the show were suddenly in the middle of it. And when season three rolled around, we'd had these two wonderful seasons. Suddenly the pandemic, you know, it's all of us. And we checked in with everybody at Bellevue. They were like PTSD victims, bad. And we all were, because, you know, we'd all gone through it in our own little way. I mean, I'm in my house with my kids, but, you know, nobody had a, a, a rule book for how to get through this thing. Mm -hmm. And being able to reconnect with our writers and talk about it through these characters in the show was it suddenly the show took on a lot uh, more meaning and it became more like a documentary. We were documenting mm -hmm. in real time what was what's going, going on, on in the world. Mm -hmm. And all, and suddenly the show leaned much more into social justice stories, which a lot of the audience, by the way, did not like. They liked us being lighter and funnier and we're doing way more of that this season. But we couldn't pretend that all of these things weren't happening. We were living this life. We were having it go on around us. And the characters ended up being kind of surrogates for everyone in our writing staff. And our writing staff is wildly diverse, age-wise, ethnicity-wise, gender-wise, sexual orientation-wise, politically. All, I mean, it's just the greatest uh, uh, combination from of all wildly talented and kind, lovely people. I love them, all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a great learning experience for me because... My, I only have my experience, you know, I came up in the nineties with television shows and I was an actor in my, you know, my old crazy pop star career <laughs> to be able to talk to a 25 year old writer who has a very different experience than mine and hear their point of view on the pandemic and on social issues and state of the world is just a gift and a half. And me. I'm sure, I'm sure the show changed. I mean, I'm sure the, the experience in the writer's room changed so much after the pandemic, after George Floyd, after January 6th, I'm sure 
the, the issues, be, I mean, in terms of stories, I'm sure so, there was so much change, yes? Yeah, I mean, the show's always been, I mean, the enemy in the show is the broken healthcare system. Mm -hmm. It's always been a show about social justice and about putting human beings before money and politic. And, and Max Goodwin, who's based on a real man, Eric Mannheimer, who ran Bellevue and got throat cancer when he started there, wrote a book about it called 12 Patients that David Schulner optioned. Um, he is a huge fighter of social justice issues, and the hospital is a magnificent place to do it. Uh, it's supposed to be about saving lives and making people's lives better, not just saving them, but making them better when they leave the hospital. So they don't have to come back to the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, being able to deal with those subjects and yet deal with them in a very humorous way often. I mean, we've been guilty of getting on a soapbox every once in a while, but most of the time it, it, the, the storytelling is fun, certainly energetic. We have a rule about nobody sits down. Everything's on the move, mm -hmm. much like West Wing, you know, um, which was a model for the show. Um, it must be nice being on a hit show, too. It's great. People yeah. know, you know, I have a joke in my show. I said I've created a lot of cult hits, which is code for canceled quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, uh, people love, you know, people come up to me about American Gothic and Invasion, and Roar, and yeah. Some people know and really love those shows. And if you go to Comic-Con, there's an audience for them. But in the world at large, those shows are, you know, little drops in a creative bucket, whereas New Amsterdam is a big hit on a big old school network. Uh, and with all respect to all the little streaming networks or big streaming networks, more eyeballs see these network shows than they see anything else. So, you know, you get on an airplane and people say, who are you and what are you doing? So I write a show called New Amsterdam. And they go, oh, I've seen that show. And my brother had that thing that you did with the heart and you took mm -hmm. out. Yeah. So it's I, nice. And it's, again, it's nice that it's part of everything I'm doing in my life. My life feels very balanced right now because show, music, family first, big family, young kids performing. Uh, I'm, I'm a very, very, very fortunate, blessed human being. I know that you uh, love sports. Probably more I than I look at, Yes, I do. You really right. love to play one sport, but I love to watch. And, just and you're, you're a big baseball fan, Dodger Blue, Tracy. Your wife went to the University of Florida, so I know how much you are Gators. a Gators, a Gators oh, yeah. fan. So here's the question. Tom Brady has won seven Super Bowls, including five Super Bowl MVPs. Michael Jordan has won six NBA titles and six MVPs. Together, they hold most of the mo individual records in their respective sports. Yeah. This is one of the most discussed questions of our time among sports journalists. Between the two, who is the GOAT? Oh, well, I, first of all, I think it's a ridiculous question because they're in totally different fields. And I, I, I don't even think it's fair. But I mean, if, if you want to play that game, maybe the best way to play it is put a Tom Brady on the basketball court and put Jordan on the, on, on the gridiron and see who's better at doing that. <laughs> maybe that's how you uh, <laughs> decide. I've I mean, who, they're amazing. And I'm sure Wayne Gretzky would raise his hand and say, hey, remember me? I was Wayne. I, I have to tell you this. You're you're now like, you just made me think of something I've never told you, which is that you know how much I love basketball and played basketball my whole life. Well, I had the opportunity to play three-on-three -three basketball with Wayne Gretzky. And Wayne, you we know, greatest hockey player ever. Well, on a different surface, he's kind of just average. <laughs> And I remember thinking this as I was playing him in basketball, going, I'm taking Wayne Gretzky on this service. <laughs> I remember you used to play racquetball with Jim Brown. Oh, I sure did. And if, and if he got in the way, I let it fly. I wasn't afraid. <laughs> uh, I will play softball every day of my life if I have the opportunity, and baseball. Uh, softball is a little more friendly for these knees. But um, – mm -hmm. I've played uh, baseball, I think, every birthday since I was like 10. Every birthday. 
to the end, I do it now. It's great. Um, I love it. I love watching it. Yeah, I do love this Dodgers team. I'm more invested in this Dodgers um, in the last few years than I have been in a long time. Um, but I'm weird, and and my wife hates this about me. I I can watch like I you know I did a television series in Georgia in Athens in 1980 when Herschel Walker was being given all the awards and they won the national championship of the Bulldogs. Mm -hmm. And I was a I was college age. I was going to you know kegger parties and you know I was doing a TV show, but I was trying to like sort of sniff out what this college experience was like. And the Georgia SEC college experience is probably different than you know going up to Stanford or whatever. But um, I watch the Gators and I watch them play Georgia and I'm torn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, because I, I like, well, you know, that doesn't that quarterback have a mom too that's rooting for him? Mm -hmm. Um, Tracy's like, no, every other team must die. I'm like, yeah. you know, I, I watched uh, the World Series, the, the Yankees and the Dodgers. I was doing the Hardy Boys, uh, Parker and I'd be watching between shots, and this was the series in '77 where Reggie Jackson hit the three home mm -hmm. run. Sure, the Yankees won. And I was like, well, I grew up in New York half my life. I, I can be happy about the Yankees and Reggie Jackson, you know. Well, so you I, know, the experience like what Tracy has. Like the Giants, I, you know, I those Giants, great team. That Giants-Dodgers series was the World Series to me. Mm -hmm. With all respect to the Braves, who deserved to win, and I'm thrilled they did because they beat the Dodgers. But that Giants-Dodgers series. Yeah, this incredible. Is incredible. Two winningest teams in baseball. It was great. It was great. You know the thing. I'm glad that you have sort of an affinity with the Gators and and Tracy's alma mater because uh, because both of you both you and I didn't go to college and I and here in the South, oh my gosh, you know the football college football here is everything. And I wish I had that connection. You know, having been an athlete my whole life, I I really wish I had had that and 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 had that college experience. And you do have it though. Are you, I mean, look, I, I'll tell everyone. When I was at the game. I Patrick was a great quarterback in high school. I was at the game where he broke his collarbone, which to this day I'm convinced maybe changed the course of his life because he may have gone on to college, certainly would have played football, may not have been an actor, who knows. But um, you are a naturally gifted athlete, which is why when I beat you now in sports, it's so fulfilling. It's never happened. <laughs> uh, excuse me. <laughs> I believe, I believe you a thing sports? Thanksgiving the family will never forget where you and your kids and your wife and all the relatives descended on our little valley. And we went out and we played some football. And I was a quarterback on my team and yeah. you were the quarterback on your team. And I said to my son, Jake, I said, Jake, go long. Yeah. Don't think he'll, he'll have no clue that I'm going to throw a bomb on the first play. And I wheeled back. Yeah. <laughs> went right over your head into Jake's touchdown. Is that is that truly the way you remember it? <laughs> that is the way it happened, my friend. <laughs> we can end this interview right here if you try. That might that it that may have happened, and that may have been your first victory ever. Uh, it, oh. and, 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 I'll, and I'll give that one to you. For, oh. and, and by the way, the one the one thing that we do love to still play, especially at holiday time, is chess. Chess is our game. It seems like a gentleman's game, and yet. <laughs> Until we yeah. sit opposite there's, one of the blood on that chessboard around the holidays. <laughs> huh? Give me one song that you wish that you had written. One? Just one. Eight zillion. Eight zillion. If I loved you. How's, that one? How's uh your song that my friend Bernie wrote? The lyrics too when he was 17 and elton did a very nice job with the melody um how's bridge over troubled water that did well this uh, is a million, a million this has million. been awesome for me to just listen to everything you have to say and i've learned as much as i as much as i thought i knew i've learned a lot well uh, it's 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 nice to finally meet you after all we years. do a thing. I've heard about you. I, I'm gonna do. We do a thing on this show, and I'm gonna do it with you. It's called "You Become the Host," and you get to ask me one question 
Uh, so any question, go ahead. Take your best shot. What the hell did you put in your hair tonight? <laughs> How do you get that that sort of rooster look? Okay. Oh, it's a little gel. A gel? <laughs> it's a little gel. <laughs> um, no, it looks great. It's from 1982. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate it. What is that thing that you've got sitting on the fireplace back there? Those logs. The which one? That's that's a Studio Ten. This thing. Yeah. It's a Studio Ten. What's the logo? Logo. Yeah, it's the logo for Studio Ten. We had it in our prop shop. It was made in our prop shop. Huh. I do have a question for you. Okay. Um, are you as proud of yourself as I am of you? for having successfully made your transition from actor to director and artistic director of this wonderful theater. That's a because great you question. should be. It's a great question. Um, yeah, I am. You know, it's it has to do with what you said earlier about letting go and, you know, enjoying whatever the next part of the journey is and, and allowing yourself to really be there. And, and, and in my case, the journey just from California to Tennessee and living at 58 years old when I moved here in a completely new state. Wait a second, you're 58? I was 58. Man, you're old. <laughs> 58? Well, I, yeah, I, yes, 58. Well, I, I'm actually older than that. I, I, tur oh. I, I, I turned the big oh, six zero in, in January. Huh. Just jumping over uh, two years, congratulations! So, but no, it, it, yes, I it, it's I, I am proud. I'm very proud. Um, I, I I love where I am in terms of who I am now. Um, uh, you're yeah. the best you've ever been, and I'm crazy proud of you. And so is Tracy and all of us. And I love you very much. And I'm glad we did this. And I'm never doing it again. <laughs> I love you very much too, and thank you for doing this. I can't wait to see you Saturday night, Sean. You're amazing. It's going to be. I meant to tell you about that. I don't think I'm going to be able to make that. Oh, uh, thank you. I appreciate okay. that too. Uh, it's sold out. Oh no, no, you'll be coming, or we'll I'm be sure recording. you can cover for me. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, right. give love to your. Do give love to my niece, nieces and nephews. Give a hug okay. to your wife, and I'll see you this Those week. Looks and the boys. Mom, if you're watching, I'm still your favorite. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Get rid of him, Julie. Oh, that was amazing. Therapeutic, cathartic, and amazing. Um, he's great. Julie, come back. Say hello. What did you think of that? I can't hear you. You're muted. How's that? Better? Good. That was the best. I can't stop smiling, clearly. <laughs> He's, he's, yeah. he's, he's amazing. He's, uh, he's, you know, he's my older brother. He's my older yeah. brother. And, it's, and, and being a brother is a great thing. So we were talking about, you know, about David and, of course, Ryan, who's, who I'm equally as close with. And, and we're all so different. And, uh, and yet we've all had this unique experience, you know, growing mm. up the way we grew up. And, um, and yeah, I, I can't wait for him to come. And, and I know mom is watching, too. So, hey, mom, I love you. Hi, Shirley. Um, uh, I want to talk just a little bit. I want you to show some stuff for us about what we've got coming up. Uh, so like I said, uh, Sean is appearing. It's sold out at the Franklin Theater on November 13th. It's going to be an incredible show, incredible show. He is, it, I'm, and surprises, a lot of surprises uh, in this show. So, so, uh, so tune in about that. Our season, I start rehearsals on November 22nd for It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play. It is going to be so great. It is set in Franklin, ladies and gentlemen. We set it in Franklin in 1947 on Christmas Eve night at WAKM Radio, the, the oldest radio in Franklin. And um, True Value Hardware is going to be involved. And Puckett's Grocery and Restaurant is going to be involved. It's going to be an incredible thing. And then, I don't know if you have this one, but I know on December 11th, we have a One Man Christmas Carol starring Mark Cabus that we're producing at the Franklin Theater. If you haven't seen Mark Cabus, he is absolutely amazing. And finally, on December 31st, we are banding together 
with the Franklin Theater, with the Harpeth Hotel to produce a New Year's Eve extravaganza. It's gonna be hits from rock and roll and pop and musical theater and country and, um, and standards like you've ever seen. Uh, and at the hotel, and we're gonna all watch the ball drop together. Get your tickets for that for uh, New Year's Eve at the Franklin Theater. I do have a commercial you can show. Yeah. Studio 10 is excited to welcome you back to live theater this holiday season. It's a wonderful life, a live radio play, December 9th through 24th. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, a solo performance by Mark Cabus. One day only on December 11th. And join us for New Year's Eve with Studio 10 at the Franklin Theater and Harpeth Hotel on December 31st. Visit Studio10.com for details and tickets. That's Studio T-E-N-N dot com. That says it all. That's that's great. I uh, I don't know, Jules. This was a really great show. It was just uh, hard to beat. Hard to beat. I know it was fantastic and not just, you know, fun and funny. And I loved watching the dynamic between the two of you brothers, but he had some really, really wise, wise things to say. I learned a lot tonight. So I, I, I hear you. He, he is, he is a smart man. He's a good yeah. man. Well, uh, let's say good night. We'll say good night together. It's been an incredible uh, hour plus and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. And again, uh, get your tickets for, for those things. And remember, please donate. You know, uh, Studio 10 couldn't be here without you. You guys have been incredibly generous. It's at the bottom of your screen. Please support Studio 10 by clicking the donate button above or by messaging STT to 208-858-1233. Please support us. We will keep bringing this. Uh, Julia, I'm going to see you in a month. Uh, see you in one month. We have a very special show on December 6th, our first Monday, I'm not going to tell you. Well, yes, I am going to tell you. I have to tell you. Our next show on December 6th, in honor of It's a Wonderful Life, we have the original Zuzu from the movie of It's a Wonderful Life. Carolyn Grimes is going to join us, along with, uh, uh, oh, it's amazing. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't tell you. She's, I, I've got her. She's doing publicity for us. And she, I, she told me the scene with her and Jimmy Stewart when, you know, he, he nurses the petals back to, to health and he puts them in his pocket and stuff like that. She has some great stories about that, that movie. So, so that's, coming up. that's coming up. Now, anyway, that's it. Say good night, Julie. It's so good to see you. I love you. Love you too, Patrick. Good night. Good night, guys.